afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Okay. Okay. So again, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, nice to see a few people again for this very unregular seminar these days. Uh, so it's a great pleasure to have Luca Cassia, who is now in Melbourne as a postdoc, um, and he will talk about symplectic cuts and open closed strings. All right. Thank you very much for uh, having me. And yes, yeah, so today I will be talking about some uh, recent work uh, I've been doing in collaboration with my uh, collaborator from, uh, from Uppsala. Uh, so this is in particular based on uh, these two papers uh, that came out in the last two years, uh, roughly speaking, uh, one with Nicolo Pezzalunga and Maxim Lozin, and the other one again with Maxim and uh, Pietro Longhi. And also there's gonna be more, paper, uh, more papers to appear uh, in this line of uh, research. So the topic of the talk today is going to be uh, symplectic cuts and relation to open and closed uh, strings invariants. Uh, so of course, I will not assume too much knowledge about uh, this uh, kind of construction. And I will kind of guide you through some examples and some basic definition to show you how we can use this uh, kind of uh, uh, very natural geometrics, uh, geometric uh, constructions to derive, derive information about uh, uh, topological uh, string uh, uh, amplitudes, essentially, both in the closed uh, sector and in the open sector. So let me start uh, with a brief overview of, uh, of my talk. So we'll uh, begin with a review of what uh, sympathetic geometry is and how to uh, construct symplectic quotients. In particular, I will be uh, considering the toric case. Uh, why toric? Because, well, it's a simpler case and uh, many of the formulas, they become much simpler and we can do uh, many things explicitly. But of course, there is an expectation that we should be able to do this uh, in much broader class of examples. Uh, so next, I will uh, define for you a uh, generalization of the volume of such, uh, such manifolds, which is called the equivalent volume. It's an equivalent upgrade uh, that we can do whenever we have an action of a group on uh, this uh, kind of manifold. And it will allow us to, uh, to give a, uh, an analytic definition to uh, these quantities, uh, specifically in the case when the manifold itself is not compact, as we will see. And in particular, this kind of uh, uh, the definition as a natural generalization uh, to that of a quantum volume. Uh, the word quantum volume here should be in a quotation mark because it's not a standard definition. But what we mean by this uh, is the partition function of certain 2D uh, quantum field theory, in particular, it's going to be a, a gauge linear sigma model corresponding to, to the target uh, uh, that is our, our quotient, our, our manifold uh, uh, that we are defining. And next, I will discuss what kind of uh, properties that uh, this uh, function satisfies, this partition function satisfies. And namely, there will be, uh, there will be, there will be a set of uh, equations called the picker fuchs equation. They arise as word identities for the 2D uh, sigma model. And these geometrically, they can be interpreted as uh, quantum cohomology relations for, uh, for the manifold. So don't worry, we'll explain all of these words for you. And I'll give you some uh, concrete examples so that you can follow if you've never seen this before. And next, finally, I will uh, introduce uh, uh, the, the notion of closed string instantons and how to read those using uh, the, the matching between the partition function that we computed and the uh, potential for a gromov witten theory. Uh, and later I will uh, do the same in the open string sector. And in order to be able to do that, I will have to introduce the, the notion of symplectic cut. Okay, so let's jump into it. Uh, as I said, let me review uh, the notion of symplectic quotient in symplectic, symplectic geometry. And what we need to, in order to define this uh, is a manifold M together with uh, an action of a group G let's say a uh, Lie group G acting on M in a smooth way. And uh, the manifold M, uh, uh, let's take it to be a symplectic manifold. So it will be endowed with a symplectic form, uh, which I call omega. This is a two form, it is closed uh, and it's not degenerate. And now we can define a quotient of M by G. So this double slash symbol denotes the symplectic quotient or sometimes also called the Martz and Weinstein uh, reduction, symplectic reduction. And what do we mean by this? Uh, this is nothing but uh, the inverse image of the moment map at a certain value t quotient by g. So as before, we have a g action. And this g action on m will define for us a moment map, which is a map like this. Uh, it's a function from m into the dual of the Lie algebra. 
and it will satisfy this equation, uh, namely that if you take the zero derivative of this function uh, and you expand over the uh, a basis for the, the dual of the Lie algebra, so as this level A, this is the same as taking the asymptotic form and contracting with a vector uh, corresponding to the generator of the flow along the, the one dimensional subgroup that uh, the Lie algebra generator corresponds to. Okay, so once we have this ingredient, these ingredients, we can uh, take mu, uh, look at a certain value that it takes inside of G, look at the pre image, that will be. Uh, hopefully it will be some kind of smooth manifold invariant under G. And in fact, it can be proven that it's always invariant under G and therefore we can take the quotient. And this is uh, the standard construction for uh, what we call symplectic quotients X. In the case that we are uh, interested, interested in, uh, which is that of toric manifolds, uh, we will take M to be just uh, uh, C to the N, so the complex uh, plane to the power N. And then we do the symplectic reduction uh, with respect to a group U1 to the power R. So how do we do this? Of course, as I said before, we need to specify a moment map. And uh, concretely in this case, uh, we can write it like this. So these Z are homogeneous coordinates or just the coordinates for the, for the CN. So we take the uh, norm square and we couple them with some charges, this QIA, which corresponds to the charges for the action of the U1R. So these are gonna be chosen to be integers so that the action is well-defined. And in order to define the quotient, we will have to fix uh, a value for the moment map, for the moment map and uh, restrict ourselves to the leaves of the moment map. And then we can uh, quotient with respect to the UNR action. So first of all, let me give you some very important uh, uh, remarks about these constructions. Uh, in the case uh, where we, we want our manifold to be Calabiao, then we need the charges to sum to zero meaning that the sum over i uh, for each u1 factor uh, should give zero for the charges. And this will imply that uh, the uh, canonical bundle of uh, the uh, manifold x uh, is trivial and therefore it is Calabiao. And the next observation, which is also very important for what I will show you next, uh, is that uh, the way we take the quotient uh, will depend uh, in a very important way on the value t that we choose for uh, taking the pre-image of the moment pump. So whenever we, uh, we fix the moment map to be equal to T, then this T uh, will di dictate uh, which kind of manifold uh, we, uh, we obtain. And in fact, it would also uh, parameterize for us the, the volumes of the object or the, some manifolds inside of uh, X. And because of this, uh, we call T uh, a coordinate on the modular space of Kelex structures uh, because the volumes are parameterized by the C form. Uh, which is also the killer, uh, the killer form in this case. And therefore T is a, it can be thought as a coordinate in the modular space when, you, uh, when we want to vary the possible structures, the killer structure that uh, we can have on, on the quotient. But the way the manifold X uh, uh, depends on T is not, uh, is, uh, it's not so simple in the sense that uh, if we deform continuously, uh, we, we get uh, manifolds which are symplectomorphic to each other unless uh, uh, we reach some sort of a singular point. So whenever T reaches a, a, a singular value for the moment map, then we, we do a transition to a different chamber. And now manifolds that correspond to values of T which are in different chambers, uh, they will not be symplectomorphic anymore. And in general, they will even have uh, different uh, topologies. So the number of uh, two cycles, four cycles, and so on can be different from one chamber to the other. And I will show you that uh, this is actually very important uh, uh, in the kind of computation we want to look at. Okay. Uh, by the way, if you have any questions, uh, please interrupt me at any time. Okay, so now I want to, just to be more concrete, I want to give you a very simple example of this kind of simplex reduction so that uh, I think becomes, uh, at least hopefully should become uh, obvious to you. Let's consider the case where N is equal to two and R is equal to one. Namely, we take the quotient of C2 uh, divided by U1 action. And uh, what kind of U1 action do we want? Uh, this will be specified in this example by these two charges, one, one, meaning that the U1 rotates uh, both coordinates in C2 uh, in the same way. The corresponding moment map uh, is gonna be given by this function. So the sum of the squares of the coordinate of the moduli of the coordinates. 
And therefore, in order to take the quotient, we need to solve this equation once we fix the value of t and then quotient by the, the, the u1. So of course, this equation, as you can already see, uh, will have different solutions according to the value of t. In particular, if t is positive and t is negative, the, the, the solutions are going to be different. So therefore, we have two chambers. Uh, actually, it's maybe it's more appropriate to say that there is one chamber only, because in the t less than 0 case, this equation up here doesn't have any solutions. And therefore, the quotient is going to be just the empty manifold. But if t is positive, then as this picture uh, should uh, uh, kind of um, show to you, uh, this equation will have uh, uh, non-trivial solutions. In particular, uh, this equation uh, describes an hyperplane that intersects this uh, quadrant in the space of uh, these two coordinates or the moduli square of the coordinates. And the solution is going to be given by the points uh, lying on this interval here. And as I move t, the interval will become larger and larger, but essentially it's going to be the same topology. And what's the topology of this interval? Uh, well, it perhaps is uh, should be obvious to you that once you look at this equation with t positive, uh, the solution is going to be given by a uh, three sphere. And in fact, uh, this line uh, is supposed to have a T2 vibration over it uh, that degenerates at the, at the two endpoints. And this kind of T2 vibration is precisely the one that describes a three sphere. And on this three, on this three sphere, we have a natural U1 action corresponding to the rotation of the op fiber. And therefore, we can take the quotient. Once we take the quotient, we get the phase of the op vibration. Uh, which in this case is just S2. And in algebraic geometry terms, this will be just uh, the complex projective space in dimension one, so what I call P1. In particular, uh, as you can also see by this picture, because the interval has, has a finite size, uh, the manifold that we obtain, which is this S2, is compact, and its volume is going to be parameterized by, the, by this T value, which you can think of as being the integral of the symplectic form once you integrate over the P1. So this is a simple example where uh, uh, our, com our quotient is going to be com uh, compact. And you can see it from this picture. So but let's go to a more interesting example. Because uh, before, so let me go back, I forgot to tell you, the choice of charges was 1, 1. And clearly, these charges, they sum to 2, which is not 0. And therefore, this manifold cannot be uh, Calabi-Yau. So if we want to look at Calabi-Yau manifolds, uh, we have to do something different. So let's look at this other uh, more interesting example, where we have three uh, complex coordinates. And we still have a U1, uh, U1 uh, uh, action corresponding to this uh, moment map, where the charges are given by 1, 1 for the first two coordinates, and minus 2 for the third one. Now the, the charges sum to, uh, sum to 0, and therefore this will give us a Calabi-Yau manifold. But now we have to study the solutions of this equation. And as you can see from these two pictures that I drew out for you, uh, now there are two chambers in which the solutions uh, are non-trivial. And in the first chamber, when t is positive, uh, the moment map equation will define an hyperplane that intersects the positive orthant this way. So this hyperplane uh, intersects the plane at the bottom uh, along this line which is the same kind of picture that we had before. But now we have also an additional uh, direction going uh, upwards, which is non-compact now. So this hyperplane is infinite. So this already will tell us that uh, the kind of geometry that we are looking at is non-compact. Uh, and in fact, uh, uh, if you stare at this picture long enough, uh, uh, you will convince yourself that the kind of manifold that we have uh, is uh, the total space uh, of this line bundle over P1. This is O minus 2 over P1. Uh, the minus two is not a coincidence, it's precisely coming from the fact that we chose this charge to be minus two. And because it's a line bundle, it will have a non-compact direction corresponding to the fiber. While the base of this P1 is precisely this line at the bottom of this picture here, which is still parameterized, sorry, which is still parameterized by the value of T of the moment one. So let's see what happens in the other uh, chamber. In the other chamber, T is negative. So basically we have to take this hyperplane and push it backwards. So we have to reach the origin, but we're going to have some singularity. But then we can still push it uh, past the origin. And the kind of big intersection that we have with the positive orthant is going to be like this. So this is going to be some sort of wedge type of thing. Uh, again, as you can see, it goes up to infinity. So it's going to be non-compact. But lo locally, 
uh, it will look exactly like C2. This is just uh, the same picture that uh, kind of I would see for, uh, for a C2, except that at the origin, there is an, uh, an orbifold singularity. Uh, and in fact, uh, more uh, appropriately, uh, the manifold that we obtain is going to be this C2 mod Z2, which we should think of as a delinear mum for stack. And basically, the, this is saying that uh, everywhere is uh, locally and every patch you can think of it as a C2. But except for at the origin, we have where we have uh, some sort of conical singularity, and uh, there's going to be some uh, stacky behavior there corresponding to this uh, Z2 action, which comes uh, after all from the from the fact that this charge was not a, un uh, a unit charge. It was not uh, one, but it was minus two. Okay, so in particular here, as we move the parameter t from positive to negative, we we have to cross uh, the wall of uh, the two chambers. So, so the two chambers are gonna be connected by a wall. And this type of transition is sometimes known as a, a flop transition or better yet a gener generalized flop, flop transition because on one of the two sides, uh, we have a, uh, we we have an orbital fold kind of singularity. Okay, so now let's go back to the case that it's interesting to us because uh, if we want to do string theory and string theory compactification, then we actually want to look at Calabi-Yau trifolds. So not just Calabi-Yau, but also uh, three complex three-dimensional Calabi-Yaus. Uh, this uh, will imply that uh, the quotient uh, and it needs to satisfy uh, this equation. So the number of uh, coordinates minus the number of equations needs to be equal to three. Okay, this is easy to satisfy. Mm -hmm. And then together with this, we have to impose the Calabria condition, namely that the charge is sub to zero. But if we do this, as I already showed in the example before, we will obtain that uh, all the toric uh, uh, Calabria quotients that we obtain are always uh, non-compact. And this will lead to some uh, to some problem. In fact, in fact, uh, if we want to compute the volumes of such uh, objects, these are going to be diver divergent, and we need to find a way to deal with this issue. In fact, the volume for a symplectic manifold can be computed as the integral of the manifold itself of the exponential of the symplectic form. If you ex uh, expand the exponential as a series, the only term surviving is the one corresponding to the correct power of the symplectic form. And in this case, even though the symplectic form that you integrate is well defined, the manifold is non compact and for you will get infinity. So one needs to find a way to address uh, this kind of issue. And there is a very natural way to do this whenever you have an action over uh, your manifold X. And this way is to define something with a bit more uh, appropriate, which is called the equivalent volume. And the equivalent volume of our manifold X is gonna be given by this kind of formula, where now, again, we have the integral of the exponential of the symplectic form, but now we have also a deformation parameter. Uh, this is called the equivalent deformation, where H are Hamiltonians uh, with respect to the U1 to the power N action that we originally had on CN before doing the quotient. This action survives after the quotient, so our manifold X, uh, uh, inherits this action for uh, you, you want to the end. And uh, to each U1, you can associate uh, um, an Hamiltonian, which is the same as a moment map. And in the exponential, it will appear together, uh, coupled together with a uh, epsilon i parameter, which are known sometimes as equivalent parameters. So if, you, if you're familiar with these kind of things, you should think of them as uh, uh, chain classes for some uh, tautological uh, line bundles. Uh, if not, uh, you just uh, think of them as uh, some uh, some numbers, some numbers on which this uh, volume, the equivalent volume, will depend. Will depend. And in particular, once we uh, expand uh, the exponential, we get the same factor as before, this kind of volume form, together with this exponential uh, factor, which is very important because uh, it will allow us to uh, make the integral convergent as we go to infinity in the non-compact direction when x is non-compact. Of course, if X is already compact, this, uh, this is well defined and we can just take epsilon to zero and we go back to the original definition of the volume. But if X is non-compact, because we know that the volume will be uh, divergent, we cannot really send epsilon to zero. And in fact, this function that we compute at the end of the day uh, will have a dependence on epsilon, but it will not be analytic uh, uh, around epsilon equal to zero, as I will show you in, in a few minutes. So what we did by defining this equivalent volume, we provided a, a, a regularization, if you will, of the, of the volume of 
whenever the manifold is non-compact. And how do we compute uh, these equivalent volumes? So there is a very nice way to do this, and I will show you now. So namely, what you want to do is you want to take uh, the integral of the simplex form. So in the case where uh, our manifold is of the type CN mod, uh, you want to the R. We take this is the standard simplex form over CN. We have this uh, exponential corresponding to the uh, equivalent deformation, where this ZI has substituted explicitly the, um, the Hamiltonians for the U1 to the power N action. But now we have to impose the moment map condition corresponding to the quotient, to the simplectic quotient. And uh, the way to do this is uh, to include in the integral a bunch of uh, uh, delta functions. These are just Dirac delta function that enforce the constraint that the moment map should be equal to T. So I have one for each U1 that I'm quotienting by. And as you might, uh, might remember, this Q are exactly the charges corresponding to the U1 action. So once we have this integral, we can take the delta functions, we uh, rewrite them in terms of their Fourier uh, integral representation. So we have this kind of integral, we plug it in, and then we can exchange the order of which the, we take the integration. Namely, we now integrate over Z first. If you do that, you see that all the terms that couple to Z, so in this case, these blue terms, epsilon, together with these blue terms, phi and Q, uh, once integrated, they will, be, uh, they will give rise to these denominators. And uh, what we have now is that an analogous formula for the volume, for the equivalent volume, is given in terms of the integral over the phi variables. We should rem remember the way we introduce them are just auxiliary variables that provide us uh, a Fourier type of representation for the delta functions. But now this, they become, uh, this integral becomes very, uh, very nice in a way because uh, we just need to compute residues of this function and taking residues of simple poles is very easy, right? Well, uh, not so fast because uh, uh, we, we actually did something which was uh, technically illegal, which was in uh, exchanging uh, the contours of integration between the Z variable and phi variable. And in fact, once you do that, the integration contour for the phi variables changes and the correct way to, to, to pick this contour uh, is actually uh, something called uh, Jeffrey Kirwan prescription. And in fact, uh, these two mathematician, I think back in the eighties, they came up with a prescription that, that gives the correct uh, uh, result for the equivalent volume. And in fact, once you take these poles, uh, there is also a nicer uh, geometric interpretation uh, that tells you that to each Jeffrey Kirwan pole for this integrand, there will correspond a fixed point uh, in the geometry of X. Uh, and when by fixed point, I mean the fixed point with respect to the UN, U1 to the power N action that we are using to define the equivalent volume. So, let me give you an example can I ask, of that. Can I ask another yes. question? So you introduced this extra parameters phi to express the delta functions. Does this have like a physics interpretation in the sense that you add extra fields to the theory? Later, these fields precisely will have an interpretation in terms of the sigma model and when I do the uplift to two dimension. Uh, if you want, uh, here you can think of this as a partition function for a zero dimensional quantum field theory, uh, but uh, this is a bit... Um, stretching the kind of the, uh, the analogy. So perhaps, okay, I will comment on this later when we go to two dimension. Thank you. Okay, so let me give you an example. Again, uh, we go to the compact example that I started from, the one for P1. So we have two coordinates, a U1 action, the two charges are one, one. How do we compute the integral when the, we are in the chamber where T is positive? Well, if we take the formula, of before, uh, we have one integration variable for every uh, U1 factor. And then we have two denominators, uh, one for each coordinate in C, where uh, you see the, uh, the coefficient in front of phi depends on the charge. So in this case, they have both coefficients being one. The Jeffrey Kirwan prescription in this case tells you that you should take both poles separately. And in fact, uh, it's very easy to do. You will get these two kinds of contribution. And in fact, you can check explicitly that uh, uh, on this geometry, on this P1, these two contribution correspond precisely to the uh, localization of the vo equivalent volume at the two fixed point for P1, and these two fixed point correspond to the zero at infinity uh, of, uh, or if you want, if you think of it as just as an S2, this is gonna be the north and south pole. Now that we have this function, we can uh, look at how it depends on epsilon. And as we already uh, observed originally, because P1 is uh, compact, uh, 
we will expect that this is this function is analytic and epsilon goes to zero. And in fact, we can expand this equivalent volume uh, for a small epsilon in this way. So the leading order, so the term, term of order zero will be T, which is exactly the volume, the non-equivalent volume of P1. And then you get the epsilon correction, order epsilon corrections corresponding to all the other terms in the expansion. So this is nice because uh, again, we have this kind of paradigm that tells us that whenever P1 is compact or whenever X generically is compact, then the non-equivalent limit exists and then the equivalent volume reduces to, or to the ordinary volume. On the other hand, just for completeness, for T negative, uh, the Jeffrey Keir one prescription tells you that the contour doesn't have any poles in, inside and therefore the volume is uh, naturally zero. But what happens when we go to more interesting cases uh, when the manifold is non-compact? So again, let's consider C3 with its charges, U11, one, one. so yeah, one, one and minus two. In the chamber where T is positive, we have this uh, total space of this line bundle, sometimes also known as local P1. And the integral is uh, given by this kind of function, rational functions with three poles at the denominator. And Jeffrey Key one prescription tells you that you should take the poles as before. So these poles when this denominator is zero and this other denominator to this zero. So we still have two contribution corresponding to the two fixed points, which are still the north and south pole of P1. But now the actual contribution at each of the fixed points is uh, defined by this uh, epsilon three parameter as well. And therefore, you, you can see that when you try to expand in uh, for the small epsilon, this series uh, is no longer a Taylor series, it's a Laurent series. So we will have some uh, singularities when epsilon is zero, which tells us precisely that the function is uh, non-analytic because the space is non-compact. And therefore, we cannot take the limit. In particular, when I write these kind of formulas, this is actually not very um, rigorous in the sense that uh, if you want to expand when you have many parameters. In this case, we have epsilon 1, epsilon 2, epsilon 3. This expansion actually depends on the order of the expansion. Uh, if you expand first with respect to epsilon 1 or epsilon 2 or vice versa, then you will get different coefficients. And that's precisely because the function is not analytic at that point. So this is just some schematic way to see. And if you go to the other phase, when t is uh, negative, we have this other manifold. Wait, wait, may I ask a quick question? Sure, um, please go ahead. So what kind of expansion you put all the epsilon to be equal? That's okay, in this mean. case, uh, I'm set, I'm basically sending them all to zero in the same way, at the same rate. So this is, again, as I said, is a, a bit schematic way to write this. Uh, but because there is no uh, canonical way to do this expansion, um, there is no kind of um, canonical type of information you can extract from this. Could it be that you have a compact direction and that a certain if you take a certain linear combination being fixed, you, you get something finite? There is a compact direction corresponding to the P1, and there is one non-compact direction corresponding to the fiber. Mm -hmm. You can do some type of regularization, and in fact, uh, you can regularize in such a way that you get something finite. So you remove these singularities, you end up with this kind of volume. The point is that the regularization uh, is not unique, and there is no canonical way to do this regularization. So different regularization will give different results and they're mm -hmm. all uh, kind so of equipment. Yes. Ah, kind equipment. of, yes. Okay. But this is exactly the type of problem that we will have uh, later on when we look at mm -hmm. uh, the instant on the expansion of the partition function. Let's see. Okay, okay. yeah. So as I said, in this other case, we have this other integral. So the integral is exactly the same, but uh, the poles are different. So because we went, we went to the, the, to the other chamber, uh, we have to change the kind of poles that uh, Jeff Kirwan uh, tells us to pick. And in fact, here we just take the one of the poles, which is corresponding to this. And in fact, in the geometry, we just have one fixed point cor corresponding to the tip of the cone or the origin of this C2. We get this kind of contribution. Again, it's not very hard to see that this function is not going to be analytic at epsilon goes to zero. And therefore, again, this comes from the fact that this manifold is also non-compact. And let me... Uh, remark for you that uh, these two functions are clearly different. So there is no way, uh, no region for the parameters T such that these two functions, they coincide. And why should they be? In fact, we have two different manifolds. So once we go through the transition, uh, we end up with different volumes and different equivalent volumes. Okay, so next I want to show you how to use the equivalent volume to derive uh, uh, information about uh, the cohomology of your manifold X 
in particular the equivalent cohomology since we're working equivalently. And the way the equivalent cohomology is encoded uh, via this uh, equivalent volume uh, vol epsilon x uh, is in terms of uh, something called the d-module structure. Namely, we can define a bunch of oper differential operators di, one for each uh, coordinate. Uh, they are defined this way by taking multiplying by epsilon and taking derivative respect to the t parameters. Join the geometry of x, they correspond to insertions of uh, chain classes dual to some toric divisors. Uh, again, if you know what this means, uh, uh, this is just a geometric interpretation. Otherwise, these are just some operators that we can uh, uh, use to act on the function, on the partition function. And if we, if we compute the cohomology ring of uh, x using algebraic, uh, algebraic uh, geometric techniques, so for instance, in the case of uh, local P1, uh, we have that uh, the co equivalent cohomology ring is given by this type of portion. So we have some free ring, uh, polynomial ring generated by epsilon and phi, and we have to impose uh, this kind of relation. Then the same kind of uh, relation will be um, realized in terms of these equations for the volume, for the equivalent volume. So the volume will be annihilated by the action of the product of these two uh, differential operators where each one will correspond to one of these kind of classes in the, in the equivalent cohomology. And in the same way, if we go to the other chamber in this other manifold, the cohomology ring is different. This time we have to a different kind of relation that we have to impose. And that correspondingly, uh, there will be a different uh, type of identity that the volume equivalent volume satisfies. Namely, these other differential operators annihilates the equivalent volume. And in particular, you see that in that phases, also the uh, equivalent cohomology relations are, are different. Okay, so after this long introduction about volumes, I want to tell you what's the motivation for this. And basically because we want to actually compute something even more interesting, which is a sort of quantum generalization of the equivalent volume. And by that, I mean, uh, we want to compute uh, some sort of equivalent volume of the space of maps from a disk into X. And the, the intuition is that uh, these kind of maps should be thought of uh, as uh, fields in a two-dimensional uh, quantum field theory that lives on the disk and which has X as target. And the type of the uh, quantum field theory we're going to look at is an N equal to 2,2 uh, gauge linear sigma model that lives on the disk. Using supersymmetric localization for this type of supersymmetry, uh, we can reduce the partition integral to a finite dimensional integral. And in fact, the result uh, is that uh, the partition function is gonna be given by something that I call disk partition function and is defined by this integral here. So I skipped all the steps for the actual localization, but uh, you, can, uh, you can probably trust me that uh, this is the result. Uh, we have an integral over the, um, the Cartan of the gauge group. In this case, it's u1 to the power r. We have some uh, classical contribution. So this is the exponential of the classical action. And uh, namely, this is T will be interpreted as the um, Fayette-Lyopoulos parameter in the, uh, in the 2D uh, gauge theory. And next, we have the one loop determinant corresponding to the, to the matter fields. In this case, the chiral matter fields of the 2,2 uh, 2D two-dimensional theory with corresponding uh, coupling to the charges Q and this epsilon parameter. And therefore, now I can give for you a dictionary between the geometry that we observed before and the physics that corresponds to the gauge linear sigma model. So to each coordinate zi that we add in the geometry, there will correspond a chiral mat matter multiplet. So this is a chiral for uh, n equal to 2,2 symmetry, supersymmetry. The epsilon i, which are equivalent parameters, they correspond to twisted masses. And in fact, you see here, they appear precisely the way the uh, mass would appear for, the, for this chiral. The phi's are gauge variables, and these are exactly the expectation values of the scalar in the vector multiplet. So you have one for each u1 factor in the gauge group. Lambda is an additional parameter that, that we didn't have in the classical uh, geometry. And in fact, it will correspond to rotation in the disk. Sometimes this is called the omega background on the disk. It's uh, completely analogous to the omega background in the Necrasso partition function for dimension. And uh, in this case, because we just have uh, one U1 action over the disk, uh, there is only one parameter lambda. Uh, but sometimes it, this is also known as the uh, angular momentum uh, refinement of the partition function. 
So this is just some words that maybe you're familiar with. TA, as I said before, originally was the Kähler modulo, uh, modulus of the geometry, but in this integral for the two-dimensional uh, gauge linear sigma model, it will correspond to the Fayetiliopoulos uh, parameter. And uh, I know some of you are experts on this, so I will already tell you that uh, uh, for the purpose of my talk, I will assume that T is uh, real. So this is the real Fayetiliopoulos. And then the last ingredient is uh, Q, which are exactly the charges as before. So no surprise there. So while the equivalent volume was encoding the classical cohomology relation, we will have that the quantum volume, so these partition functions, encodes uh, something Lupa, more Can I briefly yes. interrupt just to understand the formula on the previous slide in a somewhat wider context? Mm -hmm. uh, so when you have the disk partition function, there's of course uh, the work of Hori Roma and the other Japanese people with where you have like D brains on the disk. So is this yes. formula, can I understand this as a generalization of this like Hori Romo type disk partition function with the D brain being more or less the structure sheaf under quotation marks on the on this space X? Yes. So if you actually look at the, the result of localization, you have that uh, according to which boundary condition you put for the chirals, you can have a gamma function of a, or a one over a gamma function. So here I'm choosing the boundary condition in such a way that uh, all the chirals have the same boundary condition. I think they are Uber Schwartz for all of them, which means all the gamma appear at the numerator. And this will correspond to uh, to a brain, which is a space filling brain, which I believe this is what you were asking, right? Yeah. Yes. And maybe a brief second question. So the, the omega background, is this sort of needed in this context or is it just because it's the most general thing or does it have like a meaning like a cutoff or? Um, so actually here yeah, Lambda, you can just set it to one. There is no okay. problem with that. Uh, sometimes in fact, in later I will put it to one just for uh, uh, simplifying the, the, the equation. It's needed in a sense that uh, we can use it to, to take the classical limit as I will show you later, uh, but it's just an additional refinement that uh, you can put on your, uh, on your partition okay, function. You. It's not necessary technically. So the partition function uh, will be convergent even if Lambda is, uh, is one. Of course you cannot send it to zero, but yeah. Okay, so uh, as I briefly mentioned, uh, when you, we want to consider this partition function, the, the type of equation that they will encode, they're no longer the classical cohomology relation, but something uh, that gets deformed. And in fact, they will uh, encode the, what is called the quantum cohomology relations or equivalent quantum cohomology relations for the target. And these relations, they can be, exp uh, they can be written down like this. So we have a bunch of operators, L, A, uh, written in this, in this way, uh, in terms of the same operators that we had before, this uh, differential operator di and dj. But together now with this kind of uh, deformation parameters, uh, which are exponential factors in the Keller modules. So these type of uh, functions, uh, they, they are the old mark uh, of uh, instantonic effect. In fact, in two dimension, these kind of instantons are vortices and they correspond to basically counting maps of uh, higher degree. And the, the notion of uh, uh, the fact that this uh, partition function encodes uh, uh, the quantum cohomology uh, can be represented through this type of equation. So the, uh, the Picard-Fuchs operator annihilated the partition, partition function, just like before the, the, we had these operators corresponding to classical cohomology relations annihilating the partition function. And in particular, uh, when you take this lambda parameter corresponding to the omega background and you send it to infinity, uh, we have this kind of very simple type of identity where the gamma function goes to this simple function one over x. So f in this limit uh, goes directly to the volume, to the equivalent volume. And if you look at this kind of expression, the Picard-Fuchs operator, they should uh, reproduce the same relation that we had uh, for the classical cohomology. And in fact, uh, this kind of exponential, assuming t is positive, for instance, they will go to zero and then the second term drop out and we are left with the left-hand side with this uh, first term, which is exactly a classical cohomology. Um, but here there is a caveat and that T is not always positive. In fact, uh, it will depend on the chamber. So in different chambers, you will have to take different, uh, different limits. Uh, namely, uh, the result of the limit will be different because perhaps what we have to do if T let's say is uh, negative, then this will blow up instead. So we have to first move it to the other side in front of the first term. And then when we send it to infinity, the first term will be killed instead of the second. 
Okay, so let me give you again an example. Uh, our favorite example is the one of local P1. So what I call example two. So the quantum cohomology relations in, uh, in this case are given by this equation. So there is only one of them. So this combination is the one, the two minus e to the minus lambda t times this other combination of d3 and I list the, uh, the partition function of this disk function. And this equation is actually the same in both phases. However, the partition function itself is different in, in the two phases. And uh, here I wrote for you the result of the, of the uh, localization computation. So if you take the integral that I showed before, you compute the poles. So now the poles, so maybe let me go back. So here the prescription for taking the poles is still Jeffrey Kirwan, but there is a quantum in front of it because the gamma functions have infinitely many poles. So we have to, to find a prescription to to decide which one to pick. But generically, we will have to take infinite, infinite powers of poles. And therefore, we have this kind of sums appearing. And in the two phases, we have uh, the partition function assume these forms. And as you can see, it's uh, quite different in the two, in the way you compute it. In particular, in the first phase, the instanton counting parameter is e to the minus t, essentially. In the other phase, it is e to the plus one half t. However, what's remarkable here is that once you resum these functions, so these functions, first of all, are, you can resum into an analytic function. And uh, once you've done that, you can analytically continue across the chamber. And you will see that uh, using some identities between a geometric series, these functions are actually the same function. So this is remarkable in the sense that uh, this is not true for the quantum volume, as I showed you earlier. And so the classical volume. Classical volumes of the two phases are different. The classical cohomology relations are different. But when we go to the quantum K, quantum world, the, both the equations and the solutions are the same. What is different is the expansion in uh, instant on, uh, modes. And that will depend on the, on the way we take the poles. So then we just have to prescription, which depends on the chamber. Sorry, okay. could you, yes. sorry. <laughs> could you remind me what is the definition of this D, uh, D1, D2? D differentiate with respect to one? Yes, so let me go back to definition. So these are, you multiply by epsilon and you take derivative with respect to times. And the way you take the derivatives depends on the combination of the, ch of the charges. So your operators LA are no longer commutative? Uh, no, exactly. They don't commute anymore because of this factor. So this differential operator, they take derivative with respect to T. So this mm -hmm. factor here will not commute with derivative with respect to T. I see. Yeah. Did they satisfy some remarkable algebra? Or? Uh, no. I would say they satisfy the quantum cohomology algebra or the, the ring relation in the quantum cohomology in sense. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Uh, but I don't know if these are the correct words. In a sense, they are, are representative for the relations in the in mm -hmm. quantum cohomology ring. I see. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Uh, so this was uh, the example to show you what happens in uh, this concrete uh, case. But uh, so let me just be clear. So here, uh, I do not know how to show that the functions are going to be the same in all cases. But in all cases that we have been able to check, this was always the case, that uh, we could use some identities to prove uh, that uh, they were, uh, they can be, they could be analytically continued to the same function. So this is uh, perhaps a problem for some, some mathematician to solve. OK. So now let's discuss what are the so generic solutions to the uh, Picard-Fuchs equations. And uh, it, it is known in general that solution to Picard-Fuchs equation, they, uh, they can be described in terms of periods. And by analogy, because we have equivalent Picard-Fuchs equation, we will call generic solutions equivalent periods uh, in our case. And the way we do, we compute these solutions is uh, somewhat algebraically in the sense that uh, we look at the Picard-Fuchs operators and we try to invert them, of course, they have non-trivial kernels, so uh, inverting them is a non-trivial operation. But the result of, of this is that uh, one can construct an arbitrary quantum solution or a solution of the equivalent Pfeffer Fuchs equation, which I will call pi of C in this in the following way. You first find a classical solution to the classical cohomology relation. For instance, the volume of some uh, submanifold C inside of X. So for any submanifold uh, cycle, uh, C inside of X, so you can define the, its volume uh, classically, uh, this equivalent volume. And then once you apply a certain operator, which we call a given operator, uh, this will for you create all the tower of instantaneous contributions uh, in such a way that the resulting function is pi C 
will satisfy the picker fuchs equation. And what is this uh, given to operator? I at uh, this operator is, is written like this. So there's going to be a sum over uh, some instant tonic sectors. So this is going to be some sort of a conical lattice. Uh, where these are the kind of contribution that you expect from instantons. And then uh, uh, there's going to be a product uh, of pocammers for uh, this uh, uh, differential operator bi. So this is uh, maybe a bit technical, but uh, you can trust me that if you take this operator, you apply it to a classical solution, it will give you a solution to the picker fuchs equation. And in particular, the solution corresponding to the F disk is exactly the one that you would get by computing, by applying the I operator to the equivalent volume of uh, the full space X. So if you take the whole space of X, compute the equivalent volume, which is a classical object, you apply the given operator, you, it will give for you a, a quantum object, which is the partition function here. And in particular, uh, you, by using what I just told you, you have this I operator acting on this kind of classical object here, and it will give you the integral or the equivalent integral of the i function of given tal together with uh, something called the gamma class uh, defined by Iritani. So I believe these kind of formulas in the non-equivalent case were uh, already known because of works of uh, Ori Romo and also Joanna and collaborators. I should just say the gamma class was actually first mentioned by Hosono, I think, much earlier. OK, yeah, thank you for clarifying this. I was not aware of this. OK, thank you very much. OK. So this is the general structure that our partition function in 2D will, uh, will satisfy some sort of classical integral now. So this is actually a classical integral, but of a quantum object, which is the I function, together with some uh, characteristic class. So how is this all related to closed strings invariants and gromov witten theory? Well, because we are computing partition functions of two-dimensional sigma models, they essentially count maps from the worksheet of the theory, which is a disk, into the target, which is X. And this more or less uh, should, uh, should already tell you that uh, this is going to be gromov witten theory, in particular because the worksheet is a disk, this will correspond to genus zero gromov witten theory. So the question is, how do we recover the gromov witten potential from the function that we just computed? So a priori, there's not really uh, uh, a real motivation for what, which this uh, one should be able to do this, but I will show you that uh, this actually works. And in fact, uh, in order to be able to do this, uh, first we need to deal with the fact that uh, uh, we take the non-equivalent limit, but as I told you, this will not be defined if X is non-compact. In particular, in the Calabiao case, this limit does not exist, so we need to find some way to regularize. And as I discussed before, uh, this regularization is uh, in general not canonical. But if you find a way to remove the singularities, the singular terms, in such a way that the function that you get is analytic in epsilon, you can send epsilon to zero, and then you can use uh, something called Matone formula to match against uh, the gromov potential. And therefore, you, you will be able to read uh, all these gromov invariants using uh, the function that we computed. So what happens concretely in uh, the examples that the one might want, might want to look at, and so generically, of course, you don't know uh, what's going to happen. But in many examples, you can check explicitly that the only singularity comes from the semi-classical term. So the terms correspond to the poles at zero in the gamma function, so the classical volume, if you want. And all the instantons, however, are regular, which is very nice, because now you just remove the classical contribution, you take the limit, and then you can read all the gromov invariants invariance uh, for at least those corresponding to uh, maps uh, which are non-constant. However, in, there are. Of course, some uh, not so trivial examples. For, ex for instance, we observed uh, for this for a local F2, but there are other cases uh, where what happens is that uh, not only the classical terms are uh, singular, but also the instanton corrections, or some of the instanton corrections are singular. And in that case, this formula kind of breaks down in the sense that um, you're going to have to remove too many instantons corresponding to the, the, the singular instantons, and then therefore you will not be able to match against the full gromov potential. And uh, in fact, uh, we expect that this uh, should give an explanation of the fact that back in 99, uh, this group of people, Chan, Clem, Yao, and Zaslow, observed that for local F2, some of the BPS uh, uh, invariants that one can compute in this way, uh, they give non-integer uh, results, uh, which is, uh, which of course, uh, uh, it's not what you want because by definition BPS invariants, which are 
in this case, are global Kumarvata invariants should be integer. So hopefully, uh, this uh, kind of uh, uh, description that I gave you will shed some light on this kind of puzzle. Uh, and the resolution is that exactly whenever the, the instantons are singular, then the corresponding integer numbers that you read, they're not actually integers, but they have some dependence on the regularization. OK, so I'm running out of time. So I will now try to conclude by talking about open strings and open string invariants. So I gave you a picture of how to use these 2D functions, 2D partition functions to compute uh, closed strings invariants. So how about uh, open strings invariants? And first of all, we need to, this, uh, we need to talk about uh, what kind of invariants uh, we want to look at. So these are going to correspond to um, counting of strings that end on A type of brains inside of your Calabi out threefold. And in the case that uh, our manifold X is a toric manifold, this kind of A brains, uh, they can be modeled by a framed toric Lagrangian. So toric, the word toric is because, uh, again, we are inside of the toric setting. And a Lagrangian manifold, uh, and in particular, this is going to be a special Lagrangian manifold. This is required by supersymmetry, essentially. The way to describe this framed toric Lagrangian is as follows. Uh, you, you have to find two hyperplanes. Uh, here I have to, I represent them inside of the toric, uh, the base of the toric vibration of our manifold X. So in this picture that I draw for you, uh, this is basically X is equal to C3. There are gonna, there's going to be two uh, hyperplanes given by these two equations, and the intersection is a line that I draw here. So one of the two hyperplanes is uh, is uh, inhomogeneous, is not homogeneous, and the parameter C uh, here corresponds to the location where you the brain attaches to the to this leg of the toric diagram, while the other one is uh, homogeneous and corresponds to the framing of the, of the brain itself. And the topology of the brain, uh, by the requirement of uh, being special and Lagrangian simultaneously, will tell you that uh, this kind of brain will be a C times S1. So essentially, you have a half line together with a T2 vibration on top of it, and the T2 vibration shrinks to an S1 on the endpoint. OK, so what we want to do is we want to use actually one of the two equations, the non-homogeneous equation, this one that depends explicitly on the open string modulus, we want to use this equation and uh, associate to this equation um, a sort of a symplectic uh, object uh, of the type uh, that was uh, that I showed before, this kind of a partition function. And this type of object will contain information about uh, all these open, open string uh, invariants. And the way we do this is through the, the symplectic cut construction. Uh, this notion of, of uh, symplectic cut is natural in symplectic geometry. It goes back to 95 due to Lerman. And the way it works, here you have two examples. So let's look at this one on the left. If I take C2 as my manifold X, then I can uh, define the cut along this hyperplane, which should correspond to my uh, inhomogeneous hyperplane that I showed before. In this case, it's just the hyperplane intersecting along this line. And then once I restrict to this line, I want to quotient along a uh, a U1 um, corresponding to, to this moment map. So if I just cut, I would get a splitting of C2 into a disk plus a sphere, and then on the other side, something non-compact, which is the complement. But now because I quotient along the, uh, along the intersection of these two sides, I, I get three uh, symplectic manifolds. So in the region that I have here, I get, instead of a disk, I just get P2. On the, on this line, I get a P1. And on the outside, I get a line bundle over P1, which is corresponding to the fact that this is non compact region. And if I choose a, a different type of hyperplane, corresponding to a different uh, moment map, I will get something like this, for instance. And this will correspond to some, to some, so, some other type of, uh, of uh, symplectic cut. But this is the type of cut that actually we're going to be interested in because they preserve the Calabi out condition. As you can see, the charge is sum to 0, where in this example, they do not. So the point of this construction is that uh, it's very natural in the symplectic world. And in fact, uh, what we have is that if you compute the volume of, of one side of the cut and the volume on the other side of the cut, and you sum them, you get the volume of the full space. OK, this is not too surprising. And moreover, if you take the volume of the object that lives on, on the cut, and you integrate over the full moduli space of C, of the parameter C, which is the where, where, you, where you put the hyperplane, so in this case, the end point corresponds to this picture here. Then you recover the full uh, volume of equivalent volume of the manifold X. So in this picture, X was the C2. So what's remarkable now is that we can do the same in the quantum volume. 
So the quantum volume satisfies exactly the same uh, relations. Namely, we can define a function h disk, which we call hyperplane disk function, uh, which is the quantum volume of the of the line corresponding to the brain. To the brain. If we integrate over the full modular space of uh, of this uh, open string modulus, we will recover the full partition function, the disk partition partition function, and therefore we can think of H as being a quantum Lebesgue measure for our Calabiao threefold. And in fact, here I have an example. If we take the example where X is equal to C3, we have a cut given by this kind of matrix. The function H disk, which live on, lives on the cut, which in this picture is the uh, purple plane, uh, is going to be given by this integral. We compute the integral using the quantum Jeffrey key one prescription. We do the resummation, we get this function here. This function is the same in both phases when C is negative and C is positive, meaning that we can move the brain around and this uh, kind of function is still the same. And if we integrate over all the possible position, we recover the quantum volume of C3, which is trivially just a product of gamma functions. So this is actually very nice, but what's even more interesting is that uh, this proposal that we have in our last paper, which tells us that uh, Holomorphic disk, the holomorphic disk potential containing information about genus zero open string uh, invariance associated to the A brain should be related and can be computed in terms of the monodromy of this quantum Lebesgue measure. So this function H disk. And the way you do it is as follows. You take H disk, the quantum volume of the, the hyperplane. You compute it at C plus two pi i. So now we have to move inside of this uh, complexified uh, modulus place and we subtract the value at C. Once you do that, you get exactly the derivative with respect to C of the, of the super potential of the brain. And this equation actually can be rewritten in integrated form like this. So this is perhaps even nicer because we have the, the potential or better yet the equivalent upgrade of the super potential can be uh, defined as the, um, as the monodromy of this function here. And in fact, we have checked in several examples that when we take the non-equivalent limit uh, after doing a regularization, we recover the same invariants that uh, were computed for the superpotential of the, of the corresponding brain in uh, this paper by Aganajic Wafa and Aganajic Clement Wafa back in uh, the 2000s. So to conclude, we have uh, observed that uh, if we use equivariance, we can, uh, we, can, we can actually use equivalence to regularize the quantum volumes or the partition functions for the, this kind of uh, sigma models. And in particular, these functions will analytically continue along all the chambers so that we have just one function. And the only thing that changes when you cross, go to one phase to the other. So when you cross the walls of the chamber, you just change the type of expansions that you, have, that you get. And on the other side, we have been able to define this H disk function corresponding to a, a, a special Lagrangian brain. And on one side, if we integrate over all the possible open string moduli, you recover the the partition function at disk. And on the other side, so this is corresponding to closed strings instances. And on the other side, if you take the monodromy, you will be able to compute the super potential for the brain, which means open string instances. And I believe I'm running out of time. So we'll conclude by showing you this outlook uh, slide uh, where these are possible uh, things that, uh, and actually we have some, uh, some, some directions of research that we are uh, investigating right now meaning uh, how to do a uh, full equivalent uplift of Oribafa mirror symmetry, especially in the non-compact non case, how to include the multiple brains. So the picture that I showed you was for just one A brain in the, in, the, in the target, but one would also be interested in looking at multiple brains, but this already complicates the picture a lot. There are furthermore generalization to higher genus, not just genus zero, but this could be very complicated to do. Uh, and one could also go to three dimensions, but looking at the corresponding GLSM in 3D, this corresponds to the K-theoretic uplift of, well, of the story that I told you. And we have some partial results in the closed uh, sector uh, in uh, this uh, paper from 2022. And more recently, uh, some uh, a group of people, in particular Martelli Zaffaroni and some other collaborators, they had a paper uh, back a couple of months ago, I think, and also one on Monday this week where they use uh, the equivalent volume uh, to derive some uh, applications to holography, uh, where they match some sort of uh, extremization formulas for the quantum volume, sorry, for the equivalent volume 
um, to some extremization formulas for the central charges or the partition functions of the uh, ADS dual partition functions. And with this, I conclude. Well, thank you very much for this very interesting talk. So we're running a bit late, but are there any questions? Uh, may I ask? Um, yeah. <laughs> Do you have some uh, application of this for the beta gauge correspondence, this uh, symplectic cut? Does it correspond to wave functions or some connection like this? That's an interesting question. And the answer, answer is that I don't know yet. So these, uh, so symplectic cuts, uh, uh, I've, I'm not aware of any, uh, any literature where they have been used to to match against uh, uh, integrable system or, uh, as you said, the beta gauge correspondence. So this is, I think, still an open question. Mm -hmm. I I don't even know what they should correspond to. They... No, that's interesting. Yeah, I have very little intuition, to be honest. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I have a a question. Uh, can you include uh, from the gauge? Uh, from the 2D GLSM point of view, can you include a, a super potential in your partition functions? Uh, that's a good, another good question. So, so this is the kind of function that we have. Uh, so it should be possible. Uh, if you ask me concretely how to do it, I am not entirely sure. Mm -hmm. So it, it should be easier to do it uh, uh, via uh, X branch localization. Um, and this is related also to the picture of uh, Orivafa. Uh, if you use a, a kind of techniques that they use uh, uh, to do mirror symmetry, I I think uh, uh, it should be easier to do it that way. But I don't have a, a clear uh, uh, a clear picture in my mind how to do it concretely. Maybe it's just as a comment. Thank so you. This this is the Coulomb branch localization. So what you would expect there when you have a super potential is that you have a matrix factorization and uh, the and you get an additional factor um, which is a character uh, associated to the module of the gauge group and uh, that should this formula here should be a special case of this so you, you don't get the super potential explicitly there unless as Lucas says you do um, Higgs branch localization okay then I have a follow-up question uh, what about the um, the disk partition function uh, sorry, I mean uh, the sphere. The, this the the other partition function that you used for the uh, effective superpotential in in the symplectic uh, part. Yes, so this kind of formula here, H D. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So whoa, whoa, sorry, can you repeat Maybe the question? Maybe you are No. <laughs> uh, but sorry, I, th I think I missed the question. What was the question about this function? Um, oops, sorry. Again, the same question. Uh, how to ah, improve from the gauge theory side yes. the, the super potential? Yeah, well, yeah, this is even less trivial. So, yeah, my question again is I don't know. Any further questions? All right, uh, I think people have to leave now. Uh, I have a million questions, but we can maybe discuss in private. Maybe just one brief one. Uh, your, um, your super potential in the last part of your talk, does it satisfy some inhomogeneous Pico Fox equation? Did you check that? Yes, so, well, let me make a more precise statement. The, fun the function uh, HDisk satisfies Pico Fox equation, and, uh, but for the plane, for the hyperplane. So uh, these are, in general, different from the ones for the full space, uh, but I think they are a subset in general. Anyway, uh, no, maybe it's the other way around. Yeah, I, I think the other way around. But uh, um, yeah, so actually, the, this difference here will satisfy the same uh, picker foots equations as the as a complete the, the total space X. Uh, which means that W does not satisfy picker foots, but the, its derivative does. Okay, I think we can discuss this further later on.
All right, so I think uh, let's end this session. Thanks all for coming. Thanks, thanks again, Luca, for this nice talk. And we hope to get more, one or two more talks uh, like this, this uh, in, the, in the rest of the year, and we'll be in touch by email. So thanks all for coming. Thanks, Thank you Luca. for having me.